Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our introducer today, Ms. Karen Wigert. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Karen Weigert. I'm a senior fellow on Global Cities here at the Council. I'm delighted to welcome you to our afternoon and to our first panel. We will have two back-to-back -back sessions with a flash talk and a break in between. So thank you to our sponsors, our international and civic partners, and our delegates, everyone who's here today. Our first panel will be on redesigning the global city. That will be followed by global transportation hubs and in between, we'll hear from Charlie Catlett on the array of things, a fitness tracker for the city. So we, of course, encourage you to tweet at Chicago Forum and then hashtag Global Cities 2016, which has been trending pretty well, actually. And you can also tweet to ask questions. So with that, let me welcome our panel moderator, Edwin Heathcote, Lamar Hosbrook, Heli Soholt, Ricky Burdett, and Peter Kudryavstev. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad so many of you made it out here on a beautiful day after lunch instead of having a siesta. Thanks for being here. Uh, we have a good panel today. We have uh, Peter Kudravtsev, Kudravtsev, excuse me, founding partner. Uh, thank you for pronouncing. <laughs> this, is, this is already good. <laughs> You're welcome. That's the founding partner of, uh, as an architect and founding partner of City Makers in Moscow. Uh, Hela Suhult, who's the founding partner and CEO of uh, uh, Gill Architects, uh, Bian Gill. Uh, Lamar Hasbrook, the Executive Director of the National Association of County and City Health Officials, based in DC. And on the end, Ricky Burdett, Director of the uh, London School of Economics uh, Cities Programme. And we're talking on, we have an hour to redesign global cities, which seems feasible, uh, or at least raise the questions of how we, how we might do it. And um, <clears throat> it's such a big question, it's difficult to know where to begin, but I thought I might start with uh, an anecdote. I was, I was in the States a couple of weeks ago in a, in a conference in Philadelphia, and I met an architect who works out of uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And he told me the story that uh, in, uh, in the late 80s, uh, the, the corporation ConAgra uh, decided to, to locate in downtown uh, Omaha. And uh, to find, uh, they couldn't quite find a big enough site, so they decided they wanted to be in the old uh, historic Jobbers Canyon uh, neighborhood uh, by the river. It's a nice site. So they demolished the old neighborhood uh, and built their kind of suburban type campus there. Uh, really, really ugly building. This is 1989. And uh, <clears throat> last year, uh, they, they polled their workers and found that actually the workers liked to be in a, in a historic district. So they moved to uh, Chicago. They moved here to the Merchandise Mart. And they've now left a big hole in Omaha, Nebraska, which is even more boring a place than it used to be before they moved in. <laughs> uh, and, and that triggered a kind of uh, nostalgic uh, notion in me that uh, is it, are we actually able to build cities anymore? If people are that nostalgic about the cities that, that were built in the, mostly in the 19th century <coughs> and developed up to probably the Second World War, what is it that's lacking? Why are people so fond of historic neighborhoods, uh, whether, you know, whether it's, it's in New York or, or here, or whether it's in Europe? I mean, we, Ricky and I were in Venice, uh, the, the Architecture Biennale last year, and it's the kind of place that you have an Architecture Biennale because people will go, because it's just so beautiful. But the city's dead. All the most beautiful architecture in the world couldn't save it. It died 400 years ago. But what is it that, that we are lacking there's, a, there's another, there's a little quote here from uh, Enrique Penaloza, 
who I'll come back to in the next talk. I'm afraid you've got a lot of, uh, a lot of me to say. Peñalosa said that who was the, uh, the former mayor of Bogota? The current mayor. Mm -hmm. the, well, he's the current mayor. Of course, yes. he was. He's back in. Of course, I'm so sorry. <laughs> he said, we humans know more about what constitutes a healthy habitat for a mountain gorilla than for a child living in a city. <laughs> it's a good soundbite, but is it, you know, is it actually true? Do we, do, we, uh, do we really not know anymore what constitutes a good city, or, or is it just that we're unwilling to build the kinds of things that would make cities better? Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, thank you for, for, for addressing this uh, to me, uh, uh, for a Russian, because, uh, you know, like 100 years uh, passed uh, through this uh, beautiful period of time when we were dreaming about the new cities, uh, flying cities, uh, uh, brand new things uh, uh, by Leonidov or Ginsburg. Uh, I think that the, uh, the, one of the main topics and one of the main signs that we are actually going somewhere with the uh, redesigning of our cities is uh, the panelists whom we have here. We don't have a traditional architect among us. Mm. Everybody is doing uh, different things. I was trained as a sociologist. We have a healthcare specialist here. We have uh, Ricky, who is a, a general uh, universal mind uh, person, and we have Helle, who is an uh, amazing specialist in public spaces, yeah. and you as a critic. So I think that uh, this, this is a very good sign. The, the fact that we are switching from the form and we're going back to the basic uh, personal uh, interests and characteristics. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at new professions, because again, like the, the profession of, of urbanist, mm -hmm. uh, or how, how well, we, we are trying to call it a city maker, you know, this is a very new thing. And uh, this is not new, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is a new thing uh, for Moscow, and this is a new thing, I think, for the whole world. But can we do it? Of course. We can. Of course. So I think that uh, the, the, the work that we're doing right now in Moscow uh, is actually a, a dramatic change. Uh -huh. uh, because uh, uh, there are uh, things uh, that are private initiatives. Mm -hmm. Like we are, uh, four years ago, we started a project called Dark Quartal. It's like the revitalization of 500 hectares almost in the center of Moscow. And that pro project was supported by the, by the mayor. Uh, there is a major uh, re redevelopment of streets in Moscow right now, which was actually, of course, heavily supported uh, uh, by uh, citizens, but also uh, the, uh, the new administration of the city is actually changing their mind. They learn very much from what is happening around the world, and, and they're experimenting. You know, like the idea of experimentation was, was uh, dead in Moscow for, for, uh, for, for the last 30 years, we were going into the architecture, we were building uh, uh, 100,000 square meters of dwellings and residential. Now we're looking more at the, at the, at the new uh, types. We are looking more uh, at uh, public spaces, at parks. Uh, Gale Architects made a big work for, for the Moscow government uh, about the public space. And uh, uh, we had a major competition, for example, for uh, Zaredia Park, and uh, we, we, we were uh, blessed. Uh, we won this competition together with Dilska Fidio Renfro and uh, Hargreaves Associates, uh, the two bureaus from New York. So it was a, a huge international consortium. You wouldn't think about that um, f even five years ago. Yeah. Five, ten years ago, uh, it, it was a practically different situation. So I think that we, we, uh, uh, we are on a very good, uh, good move, but I think that the next step that, that we should make from you know, for architecture, public space, smart urban planning, we need to focus on the, on the programming of what, we, of what we're doing. And maybe coming back to the, to, the, to the big question of the global cities and the redesigning of the global cities, I think this is a question about finding the identities of each city. Um, you know, we, have a, we had a very good talk with uh, uh, Martin Roth, the director of uh, Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, in, in a plane to Venice, because I think everybody uh, on the panel were in Venice, yeah. uh, except for Lamar, I think so. But, but uh, we had a very nice talk, and um, uh, he, 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 he's German, he, 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 was, uh, uh, he lived in Berlin for a very long time, and uh, inside Berlin, you have 
so many different neighborhoods that are so amazingly different. Yeah. You know, you live when you're young and uh, and crazy, and you want to find uh, uh, new ideas in life. You live in Kreuzberg. Yeah. You're getting a family. You want a better, you know, the more safe uh, neighborhood. Uh, you're getting to Sh uh, Charlottenburg, and so on. So he was changing seven, or five, or six places where he, where, where he was living for I don't know, ten or fifteen years. You know, so. Uh, you cannot do things like that in Moscow, but maybe if we're getting this, uh, this neighborhood thing uh, on the next level, when we're talking about the cities, you know, why would I live in Moscow? Why would I live in Chicago? Why would I live in uh, uh, Dubai? Uh, there should be, for the global cities, there, there should be this, this that very special identity. And maybe uh, for this, we need to organize um, this kind of, uh, from one point of view, objective, but uh, like for example, I don't know, uh, analyzing big data and so on. But from another point, very subjective thing, we need to uh, discuss and imagine what each city could be. It's kind of, you know, like maybe even a, fa a factory of utopias, you know, coming back 100 years ago in Russia, when people were very free about thinking about what their city could be and what the cities could be in general. You, I'm just going to wheel back a bit mm -hmm. because you made a very interesting point about Berlin, which is that it's the kind of city that allows you to grow, to, it, it accommodates you as you grow within your life. Mm -hmm. you know, so there, there is something for everyone, effectively. And I think I was just talking with, with Lamar in, 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 the, in the room back here a moment ago about gentrification. In a way, gentrification is the, it's, it's the, it's the dark side of what every city wants. So every city wants to be successful, Every city wants the, the extra revenue, the, the lively nightlife, the cafes, um, the, the kind of mixed, diverse population. Um, but uh, the downside is that you actually force the natives out, effectively. And uh, I noticed that, that um, last night, uh, Harriet Harman, a, um, uh, one of the politicians from London on the panel, said that London's a city for Londoners. But well, I think actually she's wrong. It's not anymore. That's right. And that's a problem that London is London now is, is not a city for Londoners anymore. And I think probably New York is, is, is suffering from the same problems. And, and I wonder, forgive me flipping from, from town planning, I'm going to come back to you uh, to, for the kind of more practical nature of this, but I wonder, Lamar, whether you could comment on what we can do to um, uh, accommodate the existing residents without, you know, to, to make a wonderful city, but ensure that the people can, that the people who always live there can continue to live there and their kids and their grandchildren can as well. Sure, so um, let me <coughs> say as a disclaimer, I'm not an architect or no. planner, I'm a physician and a public health um, professional. Um, but I can tell you that we um, have understood and do understand the link between the built environment and health and health mm -hmm. outcomes. Um, and one of the things that we've learned um, over the years um, is that when you are uh, renewing the community, trying to build a global city or urban renewal, whatever the case may be, um, an unintended consequence can be to displace others yeah. um, from there. And so it really takes purposeful planning so that you have a place for those folks to land so you don't have negative consequences and sequelae by those uh, folks that had to be um, uh, displaced, but also by the community, the very community that you're trying to build. Because yeah. sometimes there can be a bleed over, be it violence, be it crime, be it uh, drugs or other things uh, that you're really trying to wall off. Um, and, and if you don't uh, purposefully plan for that, you're going to have those negative consequences. What we also understand is that folks um, have a very close um, tied to their community. Yeah. Um, and when you disrupt their community and displace them, um, there can be a feeling of kind of stripping my sense of place. Um, and uh, for some people, when you strip their sense of place, you strip their sense of self. And when you strip their sense of self, there can be negative sequelae that can last for decades um, in terms of how that community consciousness, uh, their psychology, their mental health, their, their quality of, of life um, is, is experienced from that point on. Chicago had an experiment that, that went over several years in dealing with some of their public housing. I'm, I'm, from, uh, I'm from here. I lived in, here in Chicago for, for many years. Um, but a public housing area called Cabrini Green, oh, yeah, sure. very poor, um, had a lot of crime, had a lot of violence, had a lot of things that uh, most uh, global cities don't want, um, decided to bulldoze everything over a few, um, few years, 15 years or so, and then to scatter those folks and 
they're thus scattering those problems across the city. Yeah. Um, and they learned the hard way that you didn't get rid of the problem. Um, it just comes and revisits you in, in another, yeah. in another uh, form. So what I would say is that we know that there is a, a very close link to, um, to, um, to the mental health, to the quality of life with communities. And we have to do it purposefully in terms of planning, um, if it's regentrification or yep. if it's just kind of urban renewal. Um, so those things are very important. Can I? Absolutely, because you were involved in the Olympics, weren't you, which was one of these big changes. Uh, can I first go back to your initial point? Of course, of course. And I don't know whether you lose your lifelong membership of the FT to challenge mm -hmm. uh, one of the points made by the FT correspondent, but I think your view that somehow we've lost the art of making cities is, is incredibly narrow. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you were to walk down uh, any of the cities which have grown and emerged in Africa or Asia right. in the last 30, 40 years. You would not say that. You may not like them, but they are cities. Yeah. Uh, they have their ecology, they have their dynamics, they have their high streets, they have their housing. Yeah. So I think we have to be a little bit careful that we're getting a bit niche. And, okay. and frankly, even the conversation about gentrification is n relatively niche yeah. in terms of what the issues are. I mean, so, so I think that might be uh, something to reflect on. You know, Two th we've heard this statistic a hundred million times, but we're, we're, we're at a council of global cities. Yeah. I think we need to broaden uh, that discussion. Um, I, I think in terms of that question of what is it that we're not able to do anymore, I think there are two possibly interesting themes to think about. One is the absence of density. Mm -hmm. What kills cities? What affects also the feeling part of a community is the absence of anyone around you. I mean, St. Louis, St. Louis, uh, United States is one example of, of the lack of density actually killing communities and all, all that. And in many cities that you've referred to, that's literally by design, mm -hmm. by planners who depended on car-based movement and sprawl. So it's actually created by the equivalent generation three or four, uh, three or four generations ago. So the absence of density, I think, is one of the, and the absence of complexity. Mm -hmm. And trying to design everything to fit in one go without taking time into yeah. account. So I think the incremental nature of city making yeah. is something that we have to understand. And also to challenge you again, Eddie, a little bit. The, the fact that um, we're coming back to city centers, your interesting example of, of, of Omaha to here is a form of breathing new life into old cities, which is a form of city making, the, the retrofitting notion of which many yeah. here in the room know a, a lot about, and we may want to reflect on that. The mayor of, of Bogota, who you referred to, has actually made one of the most dangerous cities in the world, Bogota, into, I'm not saying the safest, but yeah. uh, one of the most um, decent cities to, to live in through the investment in public uh, in, uh, transport, and social infrastructure, putting schools and libraries at the heart of the most of it. I think, Eddie, this is good news, so I wouldn't be so yeah. down on, on the making of cities. Okay. Yeah. Having said that, you, Ella, spend a lot of your time um, retrofitting unsuccessful bits of cities, whether they're older and they've been messed up, or whether they're newer and they were never good. Mm. What are the kind of practical things that you can do to public space that make a huge, that make the biggest difference? Kind of with the minimum intervention, what's the biggest difference you can make? Well, it, it strikes me that uh, many of the things that we've been talking about these two days, um, whether it being climate change, climate adaptation, whether it's being trans, transport, whether we are talking about health issues, whether we are talking about major hazards and risks, as we, as we just discussed in the last plenary session, all uh, of those activities are taking place between the buildings uh, uh, and in the public spaces. Right. And I think it is, uh, it is definitely a challenge today, I think, to, to arrive at holistic or integrated solutions where we do take into account everything we know in terms of sustainable buildings, and local health issues, uh, and, uh, and climate adaptation, and energy use, and, and so forth. All of that requires an integrated design thinking and, and process. It also requires a lot of 
uh, collaboration ac across uh, different public agencies between public and private. And, uh, and that has, uh, is challenging, I find, in a lot of our work um, because uh, as we have professionalized our societies yeah. uh, and our uh, organizations, we have also to some extent siloed them. Yeah. And just take uh, uh, parts of Boise or Florida or Miami or other places in, in, in the States, the, the public right-of-way is managed by at least three different uh, public agencies from federal level to municipal level. And there is not one, one coherent management of that public space. Now in Copenhagen, uh, where, uh, where we started our, um, our work, there's been a constant merge of different uh, municipal departments. So way back in 88, there was a merging of the parks department and the roads department. Mm -hmm. So that they were uh, in fact uh, managing the public realm or the public space, the life between the buildings. And those are the types of mergings or collaborations that we need to see more of in order to uh, speed up decision making and find the right solutions. Um, and, and I think ultimately we can do that. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we can uh, have a much more flexible, dynamic approach to design of public spaces and we can map those changes and show how uh, the public realm is actually part of the solution in terms of creating connectivity between people, um, solving the health issues in society and so forth. But we need to be more risk and purposeful, uh, willing, willingness to willing, invest willing to take uh, in, in, yes, we need to take risk and we need to, uh, we need to change our value system a little bit because I think there is a, we need to invest in what is shared in order to gain as individuals. Mm. And that is a cultural mind shift uh, that, that, that needs to happen in our cities uh, today in order for us to create those integrated design solutions. Mm. I'll come to you in a minute. One second, I'm sorry. I just, uh, as, as you were talking about that, I, I, I saw uh, something in Venice, funnily enough, of, 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 with Jan Gale talking on a screen on a wall. Uh, and it was a good statistic. It was that, I was going to use this for my next talk, but I'm going to use it up now and try and find something else for later. <laughs> which was that when you did a study of Times Square, yes. that 90% of the uh, space in Times Square was given over to automobiles. Uh, but 90% of the movements through Times Square were pedestrian. Yes, that's So there's a kind correct. of order of magnitude difference between what's given to cars and what's given to people. And that really, that is still one of the big problems in our cities. It, it is, because we don't know enough about the needs of the people. We don't even know what's happening in, the, in, in, in our cities. And a lot of the studies we do is simply to uh, make people visible and, and get those numbers up so that we can make intelligent solutions and decisions at a political level where we can actually say, based on these facts in terms of who are in fact using the space, we can make a, a, a better and more even and fair distribution of that public right of way mm -hmm. uh, to cater for the activities that are in fact taking place. Yeah. And that was just turning around that, uh, that, that equation for, for example, for Times Square. But that's the, that's the same type of argument that we are using in a, a lot of other, other places, using data in an in a, uh, intelligent way to inform our decision making. I mean, I, I remember as a, nearly as a student that what Jan Gell, who founded the wonderful firm that Helle works with, uh, runs now, started roughly 30 years ago, if not that, literally counting people yeah. in different parts of the city, which then was slowly and partially pedestrianized. So that there was this base that they knew, oh, compared to 1972, we now have this many people uh, walking, and this wonderful, different, simple, different. Were people moving or were they stopping? And if they were stopping, it sort of implied that there was social interaction. There was some, so some basic systems of this sort are really important. Which cities in the world do this? I don't know. I think Melbourne now does it as a result of your intervention. Yeah, yeah. London certainly doesn't do it, and I doubt Chicago does it. Maybe <laughs> Berlin does it. I, we've just recently um, done another study in New York of um, a selection part of all the, the, the plazas that have been built. 
uh, to look into social equity and how public space is actually supporting social equity in cities. And what our studies so, uh, show now is that 70% um, uh, of the people that we have interviewed say that they actually know more people in their community um, after the public space uh, came in, or this, uh, this, this public plaza uh, uh, came in. Uh, people also say that they feel uh, safer in their community after the, the, the place have come in. And interestingly, um, there is a, a larger percentage of people using those spaces of uh, lower middle uh, class uh, and, and, um, uh, and, and people uh, with, with, with less means. And um, that is actually positive, I think, that we are providing space for the people uh, in, in, in our cities, that they can actually use our spaces and the streets and so forth as their living room. Mm. And if we can develop that urban culture, that, uh, that lifestyle where people are actually active uh, using their city, it's both good for the city identity uh, and, and, and culture of the place, but it's also good for our uh, mental and physical yeah. health. I, I was just writing something the other day, and I don't know if this is uh, actually true or not, but uh, that doesn't usually stop journalists writing stuff. Uh, <laughs> but it seemed to me that there was a, um, a, a, an, or, an odd correlation. I was writing about Anglo-Saxon culture and housing and how in the States and in, in Britain and probably in Australia as well, uh, the home is quite a developed notion. And we, we have quite a lot of space. We possibly have a garden. Uh, it, it, we have comfortable conditions at home but we have poor public space. Um, and in, in the Mediterranean countries where people actually, they lived in much more cramped conditions and much, they had worse domestic conditions. They used the public space exactly as you say, like a living room. Uh, so it's almost, a, a, there's almost seems to be a, a correlation between the, su the success, the affluence of a city and the downfall of its public space in a way. And it's a very stra it's a strange kind of correlation that in fact, the poor use public space more because they're, and in a much more uh, complex, as Ricky said, a much more um, interesting way, and rich way. Um, so there's, there, there may be a challenge there that we're, that we're actually too affluent for our own good. Well, definitely, I would say in the developing countries and the, the, in the global south, what I experienced through our work in South America and Asia and Africa and other places is that really the public realm is diminishing. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, uh, and, and I am pretty sure that we can talk about uh, uh, we can talk about uh, all these different crises and so forth. But if we do not provide public space for for everyday life in the cities moving forward, we will see crises, social crises moving forward. Right. I'm right. Sure. Um, I think that uh, the the question is. Uh, is very complex, much more complex than um, uh, designing the public space. I think that uh, what, uh, it, it's interesting that uh, we had uh, so many different angles to look at the, at the question of the, rede of the rede redesign of the cities and the city centers. And I think that the, 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 probably one of the questions that maybe we could uh, solve today is what kind of product we as designers, thinkers, consultants can introduce to the cities. Uh, is it the master plan? Is it the public space design? Is this architecture? Is this strategic uh, strategy of development? You know, it's 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 a very complex thing that includes the, the sociology, uh, the economics, uh, uh, psychology, uh, uh, questions of, of 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 health. So, I think that this is like you know 30, 40 different disciplines. Mm -hmm. You know, like that we can that we can call. Uh, uh, you know, uh, integrated city science science right. strategy. Uh -huh. you know? So I think that uh, this is this is this is the, the the next step for for our main goal for the redesigning, mm -hmm. trying to understand what should be the contents of this document and also how we can introduce this document not only to city officials or corporations but also and firstly to people. But is this a document for 
Um, I mean, for, for every example, city in the world, no, 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 no. For I, every I, neighborhood. I, I think, for, uh, you know, in uh, in, in Russia there is this big, big tradition of making uh, strategic uh, general plans. You know, uh, like thirties of, of yeah, five years yeah. and so on. Now, of course, uh, all this uh, had uh, had a lot of problems at those times. But I think that uh, if we if we want to make any city, Moscow, Chicago, London, uh, better. Uh, we need to think about the integral strategy of redesign, uh, redesign of it, you know? But do you think enshrining that in some manifesto document like uh, the Charter exactly. of Athens yeah, of 1933 yeah, is a great idea? Yeah, I, I, I think it could be a, a, a manifestation, but this manifestation should lead to a dialogue and should lead to some, some very concrete uh, uh, design decisions also. You know, because 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 now now uh, for example, it's very it's very good that we're discussing this over here. But uh, the uh, uh, pr probably this is also in any city that the departments who are dealing with different things, you know, department for transportation, have no idea what the department of economic development does, or health department, or so on. And sometimes they even compete. You know, so uh, this is something that 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 uh, that uh, we as, as as people who are, who are looking. Who are trying to do this uh, should should think about. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. So so I would add to that that um, <clears throat> even backing up before that we need to define what success looks like, what a uh -huh. successful global city looks like, um, so we know what we're actually shooting for. Um, if it if health and vitality and wellness and longevity is a part of that success, then that. Um, means that you're gonna to have to bring those health folks to the table. You can't do your planning without your chief community health strategist there. Yeah. Oftentimes a local health department uh, director or someone like that that's looking at your city design through the lens of health. Um, if, if, for instance, in, in the city of Chicago, um, if you tell me what zip code you live in, I can tell you when you're going to die. <laughs> um, it place matters that much. Yeah. In fact, there are some uh, situations, some zip codes or census tract areas where just a few train stops away, your life expectancy, lifespan can differ f for um, by as much as 16 years. In Philadelphia, it can be 20 years. Uh, New York City, 10, 12 years. Just a few stops on the train. So why is that? You know, what is that in that context, in that environmental context that's been reinforced by the plan of that city, by the built environment that either supports health or supports premature death? Um, and we know that it's the social factors, it's the economic factors, it's the environmental factors, it's access to institutions and policies and, and schools and, and green spaces, um, access to care, um, access to, to fresh fruits and vegetables, things like that. What is your liquor store density? What is your density of fast food restaurants? Those are all a part of urban design um, and redesign that we have to look at those things initially when we're when we're actually designing cities to say, this is where we want to be. Um, and so that our, our built environment really supports social cohesion mm -hmm. and some of those other things that really drive health or illness. But uh, do, do I understand this right, that uh, it's not only about the urban design, but also there is this new kind of type of a nomad, nomadic people who are actually traveling from one uh, city to another, and, and probably you know it's, uh, they, they, they could spend in, in, in other cities even more time than they're spending their hometown. So probably uh, it would be interesting, and maybe there is some information about that, and you, you could share that. These people, they have even, even kind of a different, different issues, maybe other problems. You know, like uh, they, they, they're, looking for, uh, they, they're looking for other things in global cities. They're looking for something in every city that will help them to feel home, you know, something like that. What I would say to that is in, the, in American culture, if you're in one of these cities with a very short life expectancy, mm -hmm. you're there because you're trapped. You're there because you cannot get out. Exactly, yeah. Um, and so there is a clear economic gradient to health in, in the states. Um, and so the question is, how do we uh, revitalize communities that have certain deficits in them? And how do we increase the assets that they have so that health can be promoted in these communities? And that, that I think, to a large degree, talks about your bikeways, your walkways, access to, to, you know, to green spaces, uh, to decent education, to, to jobs with livable wages, those types of things that need to be in your city or around your city um, so that um, they can promote um, a, a health and thriving. I think one, one I of course agree with what you're saying, but one of the difficulty that faces all of us is that in the end, you, you're, you're a little bit describing a utopia where everyone's gonna be happy, right? I mean, in a sense, everyone's gonna live to the age of 78.4. Every city will have, by definition, a, a sort of 
inequality built in. The question is how do you manage that inequality to reduce the limits? I mean, the statistics you just used uh, about American cities are amazing. Just in, in London, if you take the underground uh, system from West London to East London, a man loses one year every stop in life expectancy today in our city. That's the same difference as uh, Quito in, and uh, Buenos Aires or between mm -hmm. Hong Kong and Ho Chi Minh City. So we're always going to have inequality. The question for, for us, going back to your very first point, is how do you somehow distribute that inequality so that it's not uh, there east and west, north and south, it's not zoned. Paris, well-known uh, issue at the moment, of course, because of the concentration of people from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, belief systems. The whole of the inequality, uh, or the, the less equal part of society in Paris, lives around the edge of the city, right? In London, actually, most of it is in the east, some of it uh, is dotted in the middle, it's very, very different. So the question becomes, and that's why I disagree with the idea of this perfect document. It, it does, it, it, you need to, in a way, understand what is the DNA of difference and, and what are the uh, aspirations of trying to do with that. If Tessa Jiao were here, was Tessa Jiao? Oh, it's Tessa Jiao. Yeah, so can forgive we get me. that right? Oh, I'm so yeah. sorry, Tessa. Yeah. Forgive me. Yeah. Forgive she me. Here. Dame, yeah. uh, so Dame Tessa. I the, think my... the wrong dame. <laughs> <laughs> Tessa Jiao, who spoke yesterday, was the Secretary of State for the uh, Culture and responsible for the Olympics at London. She invented a term which was called conversion. It's a wonderful idea. Conversion of what? Let's spend 20 million billion of public money to do what? Well, actually, to, convert, to have conversion of life chances right. across East and West London. One statistic, four years after the Games, only four years after the Games in East London, which has been historically much poorer for many, many reasons, Tessa referred to it yesterday, uh, some of the worst off rewards, so uh, small neighborhoods, in the whole of the United Kingdom, in the whole of England, in fact, literally the 5th and the 17th, are now the 70th and the 140th, four years after a series of investments are made. So in that sense, um, I think it is possible to actually lead a set of code. But you've got to accept that not everyone's going to have a bike park or a Hyde Park or whatever within three or four minutes from you. But good urban planning, ultimately that was your first question, is about managing those differences but recognizing them. Right. Hello, you were just about to say something. Well, I, I think... Um uh, redesigning the global city, uh, the, maybe the one biggest challenge uh, for us as urban designers and planners and so forth is uh, making sure that there is a dialogue. Um, because we can, you said, Ricky, uh, distribute uh, certain things or we can balance certain things from, from up here or from top down. But um, to really understand uh, how we can engage the 99 percent of the population that will never participate in a public hearing, a public meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to get more of the city planners out of their public agencies and into the city. Uh, we as urban designers, we need to be uh, part of those processes. And um, I, I think the most important learning that I have had from being engaged in all of the sort of temporary um, uh, public space interventions that we've made in the states and temporary bike uh, infrastructure and all of these uh, has been the, uh, the that we've been able to use these public space interventions as a way of engaging in a meaningful meaningful dialogue with people locally uh, and that is I think really really a challenge uh, for uh, any local government but also any sort of urban designer that how do we design the processes in a way that people can actually meaningfully engage, have a say, that we can understand uh, the, the, the needs of the community? Um, and then, of course, sometimes we also need to be visionary and try and test things out um, because it's difficult maybe to, if you're part of a certain neighborhood, to ima imagine how, how life could be different. But actually, uh, forgive me, Lamar, uh, yes, we... Genuine, generally now, and I'm not now talking about the, the African cities and the, um, the global south, I am talking about the, the, the global cities. We've farmed out, to a large extent, urban planning to the private sector. So we accept now that if there's a big development, it's going to be done by one big developer. You, we actually, Ricky talked about the problem of, 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 um, of, of these very 
of the lack of diversity in development, that, that the, the, these big public spaces, and the public space as well is being turned over to, to the private sector. Uh, and there is this question over, you know, who owns it? Um, are there are, you know, the business improvement districts, which are complicating things further. And I wonder actually whether the state has got much too far back in the process, whether the state actually needs to, to step forward and reclaim public space for the public. Peter. Um, yeah, uh, I think that uh, in, this, uh, in this case, it's, uh, it's again a question of, uh, of citizens, you know? I mm -hmm. think that uh, uh, it's, it's about how much of public space do we need? And uh, uh, it's, it, it's also kind of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the question of what, uh, what people are going to do there mm -hmm. and what the future will be for the public space. Because the questions that we are discussing now, uh, if we, for example, make some kind of a decision today in the city, like kind of a strategic one, it will be realized in 10 or 20 years. Yeah. And, uh, uh, what people are going to do, what, what, what their profession is going to be. Uh, are they going to sit with uh, their um, IMAX uh, under the tree in a beautiful park, or they will, uh, I don't know, do some, some, some other things? I think that uh, it's, 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 it's very much a, a question of understanding what people are going, uh, uh, for whom we are designing this, yeah. this people, for, for, uh, of this, 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 this cities, and for whom we are designing these public spaces. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I read a very, very interesting article about the future professions. You know, like some of them, uh, they sound absolutely crazy, like uh, uh, the, uh, the, the cleaner of electronic dustbins. You know, like, so it's kind of a, a huge number of files that you have, so you actually invite a person who actually cleans them. You know, how, how they're going to do this? You know, so that's why uh, the, the question, either utopian or not utopian, is, is, is a question of prognostics, of course. But actually, the way we use, I wonder if the way we use cities, obviously there are cars, and, mm -hmm. but apart from that, I wonder if the way we use cities is very different from the way they used them 2,000 years ago in Rome. I mean, I, that we seem to... Desire the same kinds of interactions and the same because like, technology doesn't change that. We might wander around with our mobile phone and bump into each other, but effectively, we still want to sit outside a cafe. We want to stop and talk to friends, go to a park, sit under a tree, uh, uh, and, and just and, and be and be amused by the yeah. things in the shop windows. Yeah, I will. I will give a very small example. You know, like we did a, a, a kind of a small social experiment uh, 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 the, the, the previous summer. Um, we, we made, uh, we called it like a pop-up art cluster. So the idea was that there was this place where we're planning to build a new residential house. And uh, there were a couple of buildings there, like uh, we, 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 uh, uh, we a little bit refurbished them. Uh, we, we, we closed the perimeter mm -hmm. and we invited people for, uh, you know, like, it's a, one time it was like a party, other it was like a, 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 an art festival, something like that. But the, the interesting point that in this, in this place, there was a, uh, the, the, the small, uh, small um, courtyard, like something like this, not more than that. Mm -hmm. um, so you are surrounded just by uh, old walls. Uh, there were some armchairs and so on. And the problem with this place was that people, uh, you couldn't put music after 11 o'clock. So uh, just because there's, there, 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 there's a residential neighborhood. And that was the most popular place. Mm -hmm. The place where uh, you could just stay, sit, and talk to people. Maybe eat, maybe drink something, you know? Mm -hmm. But uh, it was fully packed. That actually means that uh, there is a, a, a very big lack of uh, just being with the people. Mm -hmm. uh, and there actually were, were quite a lot of people who were just sitting there, not talking, not discussing anything, just being together with, with the crowd that they like. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that this, this actually leads also, uh, leads us to the experimentation that Heller was, was, was talking about, the, the visionary experimentation, where, where you need to find uh, the, the, um, the things that people want to do in public spaces, mm -hmm. the people that want to uh, do at their office a table mm -hmm. or in their living room. You know, like was a, a, a pretty, pretty interesting uh, pavilion of uh, uh, Great Britain at the, at, the, at the Biennale when they were experimenting with these things, you know, yeah. like how, how is going to change, how Wi-Fi is changing your living room, how yeah. things like, so the, uh, this is something that, that, that is crucial right. to my mind. Right.
There, I, I wanna, I, I'm want i split between going in two directions here. I noticed that in the, in the literature, there was something about, I, 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 was, I was reading what the definition of a global city was, and there were the usual things about diversity and travel and, uh, and uh, density. But there was something about skylines as well, which I thought was quite interesting, that a global city, to be a global city, needs a kind of certain type of skyline. I don't know whether we've got one on a logo here, but oh, we've got these. Uh, no, 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 sorry, isn't it? They don't use earlier. They were all the kind of towers. And, um, what are the elements, do you think? Is there, let, me, so let me break this down. Is there, is there one element, you think, that we need to aspire to, one thing that we need to aspire to in a city for it to, to be a successful global city? Mickey, I'll start with you. This is a bit of well, a yeah, question. Yeah, it doesn't, you know, yeah, yeah. it doesn't have to be the okay, only. I mean, I, I would say... It's not a visual thing. Yeah. It's much more to do with this fundamental connection between <coughs> the structure of space and the structure of society in the wider sense. And I think that can be summed up with a very simple term, openness. Uh -huh. I, mean, I, I think what we're seeing, the way you described it very well, is an in increasing closure of cities in, into mm -hmm. zones, into enclaves, into places where people are well and not well. Yeah. Into, places where difference is cast in stone, you know, that sort of thing. And if one were to aspire a global city or not to uh, one thing which can then cope with growth yeah. and therefore cope with incremental growth, all these cities are not going to be the same. Now, every minute and a half we're speaking here, a new person has either moved into, has been born in Dhaka, in Kinshasa, mm -hmm. and in Mumbai, right? So the, the, the city, is not the same city in, at the end of the day, let alone at the end of the decade. But to maintain that openness, I think, would be the, what I would respond to. In, in, in the exhibition that we did, LSE Cities and the Alfred Herrhausen Society in Venice, we showed the work, what's happened, research on 200 cities. Roughly the population has doubled or tripled. The size of these cities, 200 cities, has quintupled. Mm -hmm. So middle age spread, think of it that way, just, you know. I have to say Chicago is one of the worst examples, but it's grown less, but it's actually expanded more. But the uh, density has dropped and the amount of public space has reduced, despite the growth. And they've become much more closed rather than open systems. And I think that's the thing that planning, rethinking cities, and actually political vision needs to set right at the heart of the agenda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you the same question, Namal? Sure. I would offer... Um uh, two terms, um, diversity and inclusion. Uh -huh. um, and I would say both from the planning stage um, and the actual execution stage. So when I say diverse, I, I mean bringing diverse um, partners to the table. We talk about it in terms of multi-sectoral approaches, uh -huh. uh, braiding together funding at the municipality level, so if it's transportation services, education, um, et cetera. Um, bringing people from the community, the residents, the inhabitants of these cities. Yeah. How about give them a voice and bring them in? Um, so being really inclusive um, and being diverse about not having the same usual suspects to do all mm -hmm. the planning, thinking that if you build it, they will come. If you build it, it's going to be a great city. Yeah. If nobody had any input into it, it may not be. Um, so I think those things are important. Um, I think the way to accelerate the experimentation that we're talking about um, is to have diversity inclusion, but also we can take advantage of um, some of the um, some of the, the things that the bad things that happened. So if you think of New Orleans and, yeah. and Katrina, if you mm -hmm. think of you know 9/11 in New York City, yeah. um, there are natural disasters, man-made disasters that we in public health have to have to address along with first responders and other planners of the city. That gives us an opportunity to reboot that city? How can we redesign that city in a way that's more functional, that's, more, that's better than it was before? Uh, Katrina really un, un, unveiling some of the health inadequacies and health inequities that we yeah. learned. Um, but how can we begin to put those structures, those policies, and those agencies in place so that it can be not a utopia, but it can be a more functional, more livable, um, more healthy um, community, city, um, and, the, and the like. So I would say those two things, diversity um, and inclusion from the planning stage on. Got it, okay. Well, I'll ask you the same thing then, Ella. Well, um, I would say that uh, to me, the, the, a global city needs to have uh, a diverse public life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think all cities should have a thriving public life. 
and that is actually a quality factor. Um, and I would love to see more, uh, more tenders, more uh, physical projects, more social projects catering for that public life element in our cities. Um, and uh, and, I, and I, I think if we did have that, we would solve some of the issues on, on, uh, on, uh, on equity and health and, and, and other issues. And if, 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 I would, um, if I could go back just to your previous question also in terms of balancing sort of state government or private yeah. initiative and so forth, I think to me when I work with public sector all over the world, I see a change right now where governments are no, no longer only uh, public institutions that are governing, administrating, uh, but they are active facilitators of change. And that requires fundamentally new skills within uh, public agencies. Right. To not just sit behind the, the table and administer things, uh, projects that are coming in, but actively communicating, facilitating, bringing the right people at the right table, creating those partnerships, uh, and, and so forth. Those are fundamental new skills uh, that many cities, I find, are struggling with and, mm -hmm. and don't, simply don't have, they don't have the capacity to do it. Yeah. So yes, I think you, the, to, to, in some places in the States, uh, I have found that the, the, the public um, has been stripped f far too, too much down into not having that cap capability of, uh, of, of um, taking that facilitator role because there is just no resources to, yeah. it, to do it. Uh, so, so balancing uh, uh, our, um, uh, our governments and providing with them with enough resources to actually take that new role upon them uh, I think does require, uh, uh, again, uh, another kind of balancing. Having said that, I think um, coming from a social democratic Scandinavian background uh, where we have very strong governments, uh, I know that many European cities are looking to the states to learn how to successfully set up these public-private partnerships mm -hmm. that you have been, uh, I think, forced to in many ways. Yeah. Uh, uh, and are definitely uh, one step or three steps further ahead uh, compared to us. Just, just before I come to you with the same question, Peter, I wanted to ask, uh, there, um, one of the things I was, I was looking at here, we talked about, I, I just asked whether the state should be more involved in this process, and that seems like you know, actually you, you are suggesting that they need a lot more specialist uh, intelligence to be able to handle this. this or generalists, growth. actually. Right, okay. <laughs> but, I, I wonder, there, there does seem to be an acknowledgement. You made the, you chided me at the beginning, Ricky, for, for leaving out most of the world where the cities are actually growing the most, which is absolutely fair. Um, and, and Venice and the Chicago Biennale that was here in September, there does seem to be a lot of interest in bottom-up uh, architecture. We know what we could kind of primitively call bottom-up design. Uh, mostly for places where there is no alternative. They have to, they have to um, uh, innovate bottom up because there is no top, or the top is disorganized or corrupt or uninterested. Um, I wonder whether there are things that we could do uh, in cities, uh, th in the frameworks and the way we govern cities that would allow citizens to, to have much more freedom. I mean, there was a, you know, there was this thing that, that Ricky was involved in with the, the, the Alfred Harehausen Trust and I was involved in very slightly as well, looking at uh, innovations in the global south uh, small, you know, very, very small community-based innovations, what people could do to make the edges, particularly of their um, uh, uh, dwelling spaces, their cities, better. Uh, and then how that could be transferred to Berlin. And the first phase was excellent. You know, the first phase had some very interesting uh, results, particularly in Latin America and in India. Uh, the transfer to Berlin failed completely because the Berliners just weren't prepared for it. They weren't geared up for that kind of uh, uh, well, they the improvisation. Mm -hmm. Well, they have regulation. <laughs> yeah. As opposed to not. Yeah. yeah. So is there, is there something that we could do, do you think, or if I'm addressing this to any of you, that would, that would allow that bottom-up innovation a little more flexibility, a little more freedom? 
Well, I, I would say that in, in um, you know, a predominant part of what is being built in the world today, in the global cities, there is not a single architect involved. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it's probably 95% of buildings that are coming up in these in these uh, cities that are that doesn't have a, an architect involved, so the most important uh, infrastructure for us to manage well uh, uh, and ensure uh, that the, the the cities can grow in a flexible flexible way is actually to manage that public realm framework, mm -hmm. and we we know from having studied cities uh, globally that. Uh, uh, that we need to have about 25 to 30 percent of the city to be public realm, like streets, parks, squares, so forth. And if we could provide that public infrastructure, I think we can allow some flexibility. Mm -hmm. uh, Hello, to play devil's advocate, uh, that ain't going to happen from bottom up. No, it's no. going to happen way up there by the city fathers and mothers. That's and what I mean. Side. That so, a combination. So you're not going to solve it that way. No, but, but I think the planning of the public realm network or the infrastructure, if you may, and then allowing the bottom-up flexibility uh, it could be a way to, yeah. uh, to, to approaching it. Um, I think that uh, an interesting point is actually to look at the, at not at major democracies right now also. You know, because, of course, you know, like uh, London and Chicago and New York have very long, long history of yeah. working or urban planning, you know. Yeah. But when we're talking Not about so oh, okay, okay, but but <laughs> but, but, but still, yeah. You know? But uh, if we talk about uh, like newly opened uh, countries like Vietnam, for example, yeah. or Iran, yeah. or uh, you know, like of course there 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 are a lot of problems in Moscow because you know, like for, for only for the last uh, 20, 25 years, we're, yeah. we're we're working on that. I think that uh, it, it doesn't matter what kind of maturity you have this this tradition, tradition of public spaces and tradition of good design at all. But I think that the, the, the very important point is actually to have a system uh, how you can pick up and help any kind of initiative in this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, this initiative could be, could come from citizens, this initiative could come from uh, enlightened developer, mm -hmm. or this initiative could come from the mayor or from s s somewhere else. There should be some kind of an institution, I don't know, maybe also, like where, where uh, these things are, I don't know, analyzed or supported. You know, like for example, uh, 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 like I, to, to my mind, these are the cities where this frontier is, where, 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 where the main battle is. Uh, so for example, you know, like today in the, in the opening, uh, opening session today, there was uh, the, the quote of uh, uh, Arnie, Arnie Quartz about the, yeah. the, the fact that he's not going to, uh, he's not going to, build, uh, to do anything in Moscow because of the, of the uh, political situation and so on. But I think that uh, this is where we all should go, <laughs> honestly. The artists, the architects, the designers, because this is the, uh, this is the right place uh, to start the change. Right. Because, because this, the situation in, 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 in such cities is, is emerging. You know, it is very dynamic. Uh -huh. uh, it, 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 it becomes sometimes not, like, not fully controlled, but there are a lot of opportunities for, 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 for good design, for right for right things to do. So if I was going to ask you for the, for the uh, one thing that would, that would change global cities, you might say work in the cities that you don't really want to work in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, the thing is that, the thing is that I think that this is, this is, this is, the, right, uh, this is the right characteristic of any artist. You know, like yeah. Yeah, when we talk about urban planner or critic or anything like that, you should be in the center of, the, of change. Yeah. You know, and, and, and you, you are looking for hardships. You're looking for obstacles to overcome them, you know, and to do more, more beautiful, more efficient, more, more economic, uh, I don't know, buildings, sculptures, yeah. installations, uh, anything. Okay. No, just a small point. If I were a Persian, I would not agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> we had five, you know, 5,000 years of yeah. understanding of urban form, so I'm not so sure that <laughs> we can go and tell them what to do, but anyway. Sure. It's the okay. same point. We have to be careful not to be blinkered. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to ask all of you now. I've done my questions. Uh, there's a question just here in the middle. Can we just, sorry, could you just wait for the mic for a moment? I'm sorry. Thanks so much. I'm um, from New York uh, 41 years ago when I got married. And so I moved into this city, um, which was a big change. And I've watched this city grow in a multitude of ways. 
all the things that you're all talking about, parks, public spaces, uh, museums, dance, theater, and I'm involved in all those things. But there is this, and this is a city that had great, from the beginning, great public park system. I mean, just one of the most famous in the country. There is such a racial divide, and there is such a wasteland in yeah. two specific areas. It's shameful. And there's a hopelessness to it. I used to think that when I went to India. But I feel that way about Chicago, where there is a wasteland, there aren't grocery stores. Businesses don't want to invest there. Right. What do you talk about? Were you talking about a park? Who's going to take their child to a park? There are shootings every day. So it's unrealistic. We're talking about something that's so deep and so dark that, yes, it's lovely to have this chat about all these nice ideas, mm -hmm. but I realistically live in an environment where that's why some of the things you had to say I really could relate to, because you seem to understand those problems. Thank you. Yeah, and I lived in Chicago uh, for three years as well, and one of the things that I did as a, as a state health uh, director was to champion um, the issue of a trauma desert, and that is not having a, a level one trauma center for all of the violence in some communities, uh, thus uh, resulting in, in premature death unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. So very segregated city. Um, there are a lot of issues. Um, what I've learned um, in working in governmental public health at the various different levels is that um, one of the main ingredients that accelerates positive change is really visionary leadership and political will. Um, and that goes for the, you know, the, the state representatives, the senators, uh, the legislators, um, et cetera. When they can get behind something and then mobilize um, the communities in terms of a community coalition, then that voice can be much louder to really echo um, and get the resources that are needed. I agree with some of the comments in terms of the capacity is often not there um, in terms of the skill sets, um, but through a brokering with privates and the public partnerships, I think that that can, that can accelerate things, but I think it takes that visionary leadership um, because that leader has the convening authority. They can change and influence policy. They can change and influence uh, incentives and disincentives. They can move the puzzle pieces around to enable those changes to happen. It takes an engaged community, um, I think, to really move, but it also takes that visionary leadership. So. I, I think at the, at the beginning, uh, thanks for your question, but I think at the beginning Ricky mentioned uh, density as one of the critical things in cities and there was this disastrous policy, which as far as I understand is still going on in a lot of cities, including here, of demolishing uh, blocks where there are issues, where there are problems, where there are crack houses and, 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 and the homeless are taking over houses, they demolish the house. So you're left with these uh, deserts, you know, as you said, well, it's incredible it's, it's, deserts, it's, it's, with it's, a few it's, kind of spare teeth sticking out. Yeah, I mean, it's a legacy of racist policies which go back yeah. to mortgage lending, track housing Absolutely. from 60, 70, 100 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Steep otherwise I agree. Uh, another question here, lady in the glasses. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Olson, president of Preferred Futures here in Chicago. My question is for um, all of you. Uh, so far, I haven't heard mention of a large segment of the population of the world which are children, mm -hmm. and I wondered what you think if we design cities thinking about children? It's a good question. I'll offer, I'll offer one sure. thing. Um, what we know in terms of the, the mental health aspects, the psychological development uh, of children, is that they thrive with access to green spaces. If it's parks, if it's community gardens, you know, um, uh, whatever the case may be, landscaping, um, that has been shown um, to help cognitive development, that's been shown to help to dampen uh, symptoms of someone with ADHD. Um, it really is important for um, our, our children to have access to, to those things. In fact, as a physician, what we'd like to do sometimes is prescribe nature, you know, just like we like to prescribe uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, because those things are really so important um, in terms of development, also in coping with adults as well. So, but for children, green spaces are, are a very positive thing that can be put into designs in terms of the built environments. You know, sometimes we make even you know, greater, very important to think of children, of course, but uh, Jeannie the gang drove me around uh, your beautiful park over there. Fantastic new play structure right next to an eight-lane motorway. You know, so sometimes it's the disconnectedness happens literally sort of in your front door. But most of the cities we're talking about, which are truly global, have average populations 20, 30 percent, uh, sorry, 50 uh, percent under the age of 15. 
So these are cities that have to deal with this, but not dealing with it well. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if we want to have families in cities, uh, which we do, I think we need to, to, to design the cities as well for, for the kids living there and growing up there. In, the, in Copenhagen, we have achieved more than 50% of the population now cycling uh, to, to school, to work, to university, and so forth, um, cross, uh, cross different uh, economic background and so forth, and cultures. And what we have found out is also for the kids when they're active, when they're actively work, walking or biking to school, they're more, um, uh, uh, more likely to be concentrated uh, in school and they learn more. Um, and, uh, and we have actually also found that when we do, for example, urban gardening projects, uh, that um, the, the kids love to be involved when there are uh, elements where, where they can actually actively uh, do something with that nature uh, in, in the city, not just uh, go and play, but actually uh, understand um, the environment by, by, by actively uh, planting and so forth. And what we have seen is that those activities are, are actually bringing the generations closer together. Um, because uh, both uh, grown-ups, but also elderly uh, people that maybe uh, are more lonely and have, have, have no family around them anymore, uh, they grow their network through uh, these types of community activities. So uh, not only beneficial for the kids, um, uh, uh, or those kids with uh, social issues, but, but also uh, definitely also for the older population. Mm. Mm. I think the, the, the most interesting question is the question of education, uh, to my mind again, and uh, the, the, uh, the issue that I, I raised a little bit before about the future professions, I think it's very important because what, what kind of uh, things uh, our kids are going to do you know, in the future, and uh, uh, creating the environment where they can uh, not, uh, you know, they just get the facts, actually, that they can learn uh, and uh, be prepared to any kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, situations. Um, uh, today, uh, d d during the, the, the second session, uh, uh, Gillian was, was saying that uh, in, in her previous uh, um, Soviet Union experience, mm -hmm. uh, she was saying that, you no know, things that would be catastrophic in the United States, in, in, in Soviet Union, would be uh, very, uh, very, like, Ordinary. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't. I, I'm not talking about the extremes, but I think that uh, our our kids they should be prepared to dramatic changes. Uh, some of them could be good. Some of them could be could be uh, could be bad. But uh, the the way we educate them, uh, the way we design the space for them, the way that we design the cities definitely should help them to to uh, to grow uh, stronger and to be prepared to a lot of uh, new things. Right. I mean, I think. Uh, that there is a problem here with what we were talking about earlier with gentrification, that the, um, the centers of cities, whether it's New York or Chicago or London, are absent of, of children you know, in, in big part now because families can't afford to live there. It's kind of international oligarchs, maybe, maybe the odd kind of gay couple or kind of international CEO or whatever. But it's, uh, it, it, the, the center of cities are not places for children anymore. So I was in Paris the other day, and actually the center of Paris, which is stonkingly expensive as well, was actually full of children. I was really surprised. And the schools are right in the middle, and it, 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 it's quite a heartening sight, actually. It changes the, the way you see the city because kids have an enthusiasm and they, they see the city in a different way. So I think that's, that's actually a very uh, valuable question. We should all be thinking about that. Um, there's another question on the edge of the uh, fourth row back. Thank you. Um, I live in Chicago, and I haven't owned a car in about 30 years. And I think that the car is the worst thing that's happened to cities over that time. And how do we get rid of them? Or I mean, seriously. I mean, I know yeah. that we can't get rid of them, but how do we really create public space for pedestrians? How can we take back? I bike and walk everywhere. It's very dangerous out there. People don't obey speed limits there. Uh, anyway, so I'd like to know how to get rid of cars. I, I'm selling my car right now. Okay. Honestly, no, no, honestly, for the, for the last, for, uh, uh, there is no need for the car in Moscow anywhere. Yeah, okay. So. Well, that's number one. <laughs> well, I mean, Sell it. Number two. I mean, if, if, as in Chicago or many other cities of the world that we've talked about, 
Sao Paulo, Mexico City, whatever, you allow cities to extend forever, you're always going to have to have cars to bring people to work and back, right? You're lucky that you have a lifestyle that allows you to cycle or walk everywhere. Hardly anyone in the sort of cities we're talking about has that. No, no, you're, you're lucky. Now, so the answer to your question, which is a very, very valid one, and the answer is not a bottom-up issue, is to stop cities sprawling, to promote by design, by government uh, fiat, that cities must stop at a certain point. In London, we have something called the Green Belt. In Portland, Oregon, you have the urban growth boundary. And that you only allow development, only allow development, where there is good public transport. In Mexico City, Richard Rogers has built a 70-story tower. And right next to it, there's a 30-story tower for car parking. Richard Rogers, the same architect in London, has built a 70-story tower in the middle of the city of London, and there are 17 car parking spaces because there's a policy which basically promotes development around public transport hubs. That's the, sort of, that's the answer. You're not going to solve it with local action. I would agree. I think when you're talking about um, issues like that, you're talking about uh, policies, you're talking about incentives uh, and disincentives uh, to get people to bike. Um, you're talking about uh, using some of those reboot periods, those bad things that happen to really redesign things differently um, so that you don't have uh, that issue. Um, but it extends further than that. When we're looking at health uh, implications, um, and we're looking at very high rates of asthma, let's just say of kids, and we find out that there's a bus depot right next door to the residential area, you know, that's, that's zoning, that's policy, that's, you know, that's changing really the, you know, the playing card for folks so that, so we can make that link between urban design, um, exposure to pollutants, and then, you know, unnecessary hospitalizations and things like that. So I think you have some levers, but again, it's going to be at the top, more at the top level um, in, in terms of your policies, your, your, your laws, and some of your incentives. Mm. Heather, I mean, Copenhagen knows all about this, doesn't it? Yes, well, I, I think we need to understand that traffic is not only about infrastructure, it's about the culture of and the behavior. And what I feel um, we have been successful with in Copenhagen is, yes, I agree, it is a top-down decision, it is about political leadership, but there is very few governments that dare think long enough unfortunately, because of our four-year election cycles and what have you. Uh, so, so to think that the politicians in uh, Copenhagen in the 60s would have voted, voted for a 50% cycle ratio uh, is, is unheard of. So what we do need is to, uh, uh, we do need to find mechanisms, processes, where we can um, grow that culture and provide the, the the right data uh, to support the right decision making in the process, because I do think it is it's a combination of um, an incrementalism uh, and uh, as well as a top-down strong political leadership. But we do need some type of in, 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 um, incremental change uh, so that we can develop that culture as we go. Today in Copenhagen, politically, it would be political suicide to go out and say, I'm against bicycling, because more than 50% of the population bicycles. Um, I'm going uh, so to stop you there, just okay. because the next session is on transport, and I don't want to okay. change everything up. <laughs> <laughs> my response so is <laughs> as well. So, so forgive me cutting the question short, but I'm sure there's, there's more to be said. So anyway, we have a, we have a very super quick uh, takeaway from here. The things that we need to do for cities are openness, diversity and inclusion, uh, uh, the p thriving public life, we need to work in the center of, uh, of the change, and we need to prescribe nature, which sounds like, uh, it sounds like the kind of manifesto you said couldn't be written. <laughs> really. So I'll say thank you so much for uh, coming. We've got a, uh, following this, there's a very short eight minute uh, flash talk, so don't go away, but after that there will be a, uh, a break, uh, a coffee break, uh, and then maybe transport after that, more transport after that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. That's super. That's really good. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank you Brilliant. to our Brilliant. panel. I'm going to add one thing to our list, and that is to have a thriving global city. Punctuality. It's a tight break. It's eight minutes. There is coffee. It's hot. You'll still have to drink it quickly. Uh, and then come back in here for the flash talk from Charlie Catlett. So thank you, everyone. Forgive me. I'm so sorry. Yeah. So they get the quick break, and then they got Charlie. Okay. Okay.